And we're going to focus a lot on our wild and wonderful state today, the awesome Appalachian state of West Virginia. Most of the pictures in this presentation are going to be about caterpillars that you can find in your backyard right now because it is caterpillar season. So first things first, what is a caterpillar? And a caterpillar in uh, the dictionary is listed as a worm-like larval form of an insect. <laughs> and so insects are a type of animal, right? And what differentiates insects from worms is that our caterpillars here have six pronounced legs. And I hope you can see my mouse as I point to these really prominent legs that the caterpillar uses to climb around and move around and look for food. And it also has these really interesting structures called prolegs. If any of you have ever held a caterpillar, you'll see how they kind of scoot along your finger and they can grab on. Well, that's because they're using these back additional legs they have called prolegs that kind of have suction cups on them. But they start out coming out of these little tiny eggs like this super cute orange caterpillar here and they will grow in steps to eventually become a very large caterpillar that we can see right about now because it is wrapping up caterpillar season because these guys are eating the foliage that is about to turn different colors, make our home state incredibly beautiful, and then those leaves will fall and the caterpillars will go on to their next step of life. But caterpillars are also different from worms in that they have these really big heads that are pretty pronounced that have eyes. And on this guy, it looks like it has a really big eyeball here, but actually caterpillar eyes are very small little tiny dots and they don't see like us, they just see light. So they are directed in certain ways by the way that they process light, like the sun moving through the sky and things like that. They also have antennae like all insects. So this little nub on its head is its antenna, which it uses to smell and to touch the area that it's going to as it looks for food. Caterpillars also have these really big holes on their sides and they're called spiracles. Every single caterpillar has these and sometimes they're really obvious and sometimes they're not. But on the case of this big green caterpillar here, we can see these holes on the side of their body and that is how they breathe. So they don't have lungs like you and I, they have these holes where the air just comes through their body passively and they just breathe the air that's around them without any organs like we have. And I like to call them by definition an eating machine. And you will see some of the stuff that they do today. We do have some live caterpillars that I will show you. Their only job is to eat and they will become bigger and bigger each time that they eat. So that way they can be nice and big and fat to overwinter and become adults later on. And when a caterpillar comes in, it becomes an adult, it has to do something called pupating. And pupating, like this picture here, chrysalis three, allows them to metamorphosize, which means change into a winged adult. And in this case, in a caterpillar that's really common in our area and everyone's probably familiar with is the monarch butterfly. So it starts out as an egg, hatches and continuously eats and eats and eats and eats until it gets big enough to make a chrysalis and it will wait there and develop its wings and become an adult and start the cycle all over again. So this is a fun question just because I'm an entomologist and I study all sorts of insects and I take this for granted, but I feel like not all people know what caterpillars turn into. So do all caterpillars turn into butterflies? Yes or no? The answer is no, they do not all turn into butterflies. So the order of insects, which you can think of as a group or a type of insect, the order Lepidoptera turns into butterflies and moths. So moths and butterflies are not the same. They are very different but they look kind of similar. And this gorgeous caterpillar is in West Virginia. This is a Cercropia moth, and it turns into this beautiful moth here on the right side. Now, there's a chart here that shows the difference between butterflies and moths, 
And our butterflies are usually very colorful and you'll see them during the day flying around and visiting flowers. And they also have different features like folding their wings upright when they're resting and some other really distinct features. But our moths are usually kind of brown. They aren't very obviously colored and beautiful. I think they're beautiful, but they are very colorful because they fly around during the nighttime. So they usually have larger antennae and they use that because they aren't relying on seeing as much as our butterflies. They're using things like smell to find flowers and other things that they wanna eat. And there are more moth species than butterfly species, even though you probably have heard a lot more about butterflies. But if you think about it, what are we doing at nighttime when the moths are flying around? We're usually sleeping and we aren't very good at seeing at night. So there's less documentation of moths but scientists today have developed a lot of ways that we can attract moths to us, see moths at night with special technology and learn more about them. And we've learned that there's a lot more moths than there are butterflies. There's also a really weird group of insects that's in another order that goes by the name Hymenoptera. And that is a group of insects like bees and wasps and ants. And there's this really weird oddball type of insect called a sawfly that also has caterpillars. And I picked this species down here because it kind of looks like, you know, spooky time, October is coming. This guy looks like a skeleton, but this is a sawfly larva. And it will go through the metamorphosis, just like other caterpillars, where it pupates and then becomes an adult. And this kind of looks a lot more like a wasp, right? So they're closely related to wasps and bees and not our butterflies. And if you're ever curious about how you can tell the difference between a sawfly caterpillar or a butterfly or moth caterpillar, you can count their distinct prolegs. So those additional legs that they have, different from those six that are up front and pointy and clinging onto stuff, if you can say or spell sawfly, S-A-W-F-L-Y, on the number of prolegs that they have, that means it's a sawfly. But our moths and butterflies usually only have four, so you can't spell sawfly. Just a fun little fact. Maybe you'll win Jeopardy one day. Okay, let's move on to how do we find caterpillars because it is caterpillar season. Well, cater caterpillars mostly feed during the day because again, they use light with that special little tiny eye to tell where they're going. So at nighttime, they can realize that it's not day and they should hide because things like bats and other stuff are gonna be out to try to eat them. So they hide during the nighttime. So we should be out during the day looking for them. And we should look for things like these holes in a leaf, right? If you get kind of good at knowing what tree leaves are supposed to look like, you can look and see, oh, this one has a big hole in it here. There's a hole right here. And here's a big hole, right? And I hope you see it there, even though it is green and kind of, uh, you know, camouflaged. But if we look closer, we can turn over leaves because again, caterpillars are tasty snacks for a lot of different animals. They usually hide on the underside of leaves where they're eating and you can find a beautiful caterpillar. And again, this is all about West Virginia. So this is our laurel caterpillar. Or it's a sphinx moth and it has this little cool pointy blue tail and it likes to eat all different types of forest trees and you can find it a lot on laurel. So the mountain laurel shrubs that we have, but here it is feeding on an ash tree, which is a native tree of West Virginia. And just to show you, uh, myself and my colleague Kevin went out looking for caterpillars for this talk today, so they are still out. And this was something that drew my eye to a tree. I saw that there were a lot of leaves that had chew marks in them. So there's a big part of the leaf that is missing, and it is because there is a caterpillar on it. So here's a caterpillar just hanging out in the wrinkle of the leaf, and he was, you know, kind of leaving evidence that they were feeding there. Another example that's right in front of me is this elm leaf here. See this big chew mark in the elm? Well, if we turned it over, we can see that there's a very cute little caterpillar hanging on the bottom of this leaf. And I have to identify what it is yet, but it's probably a sphinx moth. I think Kevin might actually know because he found this one. But this sphinx moth was hiding on the underside of this leaf 
just like that. It's green and camouflaged, but we now know that we can look for these holes in the leaves to find them. And sometimes we can be super sluice in finding caterpillars if you get really good at plant ID. So there's different types of trees and other shrubs in our forest. And we can say, oh, I know that that is a maple leaf. Maybe there's this type of caterpillar on it. And that's exactly what I did when trying to find this caterpillar, where I knew that this caterpillar, which is the pipevine swallowtail caterpillar, only feeds on two plants in West Virginia. One of them is in this picture here, the Dutchman's pipe vine, which is super common. It's this vine that grows up in the trees and it has these really big heart shaped leaves and these really interesting seed pods. And this caterpillar again was chewing on the seed pod and made it look really weird. So I was able to kind of super sleuth it out and find this pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. So now that we are, know how to find them, what should you do when you find them? Is it safe to touch caterpillars? Well, sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes it's not. So before you turn over that leaf and identify or figure out what kind of caterpillar this is, you should go to your field guides or some kind of other reference or maybe a trusted entomologist that's taking you on a hike and try to identify the caterpillar. Because in West Virginia, we have a couple of species that will really give you a powerful sting. And this is an example of the black waved flannel moth, this white fuzzy one. If they're hairy, I usually stay away because those spines and the hair is like a do not touch me signal. Another one that I've seen a lot lately of is this Io moth caterpillar, which has a really powerful sting. And I actually had a friend whose son touched one and had to go to the hospital. So it can be really kind of devastating. But these three of them are like the big bad boys of West Virginia. And most of the other caterpillars are very safe. But I do want you to be aware that that white fuzzy one is very common right now at this time of the year because they're feeding and getting ready to pupate in the, in the ground here. So if you see any cat fuzzy caterpillars that really look like they wanna be pet, just resist those urges and do not pet the caterpillars. But why are caterpillars so important in ecology? Well, like I mentioned before, a lot of things are trying to find and eat them because they are very tasty and <laughs> maybe not for us, even though you can eat certain types of caterpillars, uh, a lot of different birds and mammals in our fields and forests find them very tasty. And because they are so numerous, they create a really big portion of our native animals diets. And they can even be important for some microorganisms like fungi. So here's a caterpillar that was infected by a fungus that only eats caterpillars. So this is Cordyceps militaris that is eating a caterpillar. Pretty incredible. This is a Catulpa sphinx moth caterpillar, which is found, we just found it outside at our park uh, yesterday. And it has become a food source for a very specific type of wasp that eats caterpillars. And when you start to like think about all of these things that rely on them, it's really interesting. If you ever find eggs of a moth, you'll see that there are hundreds of them laid because the moth is kind of at the bottom of the food chain and it's anticipating a lot of its eggs and larvae, the caterpillars to be eaten. So it overlays an abundance of eggs. So that way it can make sure, you know, based off of statistics that there will be someone to carry on the cycle and make it all the way to a moth or a butterfly and lay more eggs. This is also a native species in West Virginia. This is the oak horned uh, orange striped moth right here. So how can we help protect caterpillars? Because they are not invincible, even though there are a lot of them that are laid by their moth or butterfly parents on the leaves we need to actively participate too because humans really affect the ecosystem in good and bad ways. But a good way that you can help 
caterpillars is by planting a garden with food that they like. So this is my little tiny deck here in Lewisburg. And I don't have a lot of room, but I planted about five different pots of native plants. And every day I go check it out and there is something on it. And I see a lot of butterflies and I just thought of taking pictures um, for this yesterday. So there's no butterfly pictures. There's just a cool little wasp. But I see this thing getting visited all the time by butterflies. And I imagine that somebody has laid eggs on them and caterpillars will probably be there next year. But these caterpillars, some of them are generalists, that, which means that they'll eat anything. They'll eat a bunch of different tree species. But some of them are really host specific. And what host specific means is that they might eat only one thing or two things or only a certain group of things. And the, an example that you're probably familiar with is the monarch butterfly, right? So these are monarch caterpillars and they are eating milkweed. And that is what you'll get those little packets of seeds that say save the monarchs. It's milkweed seed because the monarchs only eat the mostly they only eat the milkweed plants. So you can plant these, they're native plants in your garden and you can really help out caterpillars that way. And then this is another one that you might see in your garden. It likes to eat things like parsley and uh, other things that are related to parsley. This is a swallowtail caterpillar and it's also a native species to West Virginia. And if you have a little garden like this, you can take pictures with your family and friends on your phone on just one of those apps like iNaturalist and you can submit it and scientists like me look at that website all the time and say, oh wow, someone had a really rare species in their garden and that can help us figure out how to protect it by maybe saying, wow, it was growing on a blue mist flower. Maybe we should plant more blue mist flower for it to have food to make more caterpillar babies. And another really helpful thing you can do for caterpillars is to leave messy gardens during the winter because a lot of these caterpillars will eat things like the seeds that are on flowers. So flowers eventually will fade, right? But they have produced seeds for the next generation. Well, some caterpillars really rely on eating those seeds once the flowers and the leaves have started to come off the plants. And they will then eventually drop down or maybe pupate into the plant material there. So a big effort to save caterpillars and moths and butterflies is to leave the leaves in your garden because the caterpillar that was feeding on this bush, once it got full enough of eating food, it dropped down into that leaf litter there and that's where it will pupate and become a adult later in the season or perhaps next year. Like this Luna moth, which is a native moth in West Virginia. They're very common actually, but again, you don't see them because you're sleeping when this thing's flying around. But sometimes people will just see them at gas stations and stuff in the middle of the night because they're attracted to light. But these will pupate in leaves in a garden just like that. So if you get rid of those leaves, you could potentially be throwing away a moth that's just waiting to emerge. And there aren't some cat or there are some caterpillars we don't necessarily like as humans, right? Because if you're growing tomatoes, you probably have seen the tomato hornworm eating your tomatoes. This is from our greenhouse here. And there's also other caterpillars we had growing on our kale and our kohlrabi, and they were eating the vegetables that we need to feed people at our camp and to feed our families. But you know, we can manage those caterpillars in a way that won't hurt other caterpillars. Because if you use chemical pesticides to control these caterpillars, those poisons can hurt more than just one type of caterpillar. And eventually they could, you know, hurt us or they could hurt birds or other species of animals. So the best thing to do is to learn what these caterpillars are and to just hand pluck them off of your gardens, right? Because you'll probably only have two or three tomato plants and you can monitor them and pluck off those caterpillars, throw them in the yard. And I guarantee you might even see a bird fly down and say, thank you and eat that caterpillar. So you're helping the rest of the environment instead of poisoning them by feeding them to something else. And this is a really easy thing to do if you're growing kale or broccoli. You can look for these yellow eggs of the cabbage moth and just smush them with your finger because these little 
eggs will, will hatch into many different cabbage moths that will eat away everything that you're trying to grow for your family. But West Virginia is one of the most diverse areas on the planet. So this is a really cool map from the Nature Conservancy that shows these red areas are biological hotspots, which means that we have many different species of organisms. And West Virginia, actually right where our office is pretty much, has one of the highest diversity areas in the United States, along with some areas of California, but we have more than 500 known species of caterpillars in West Virginia. And I say known because there's a lot we still have to learn yet. And 128 of those are butterfly species. So remember I said most of them are moths. And here is a really interesting uh, butterfly we have called Diana's fritillary. And it is in the mountains of West Virginia. And it will have very specific habitat requirements that can only be found in certain stages of forest growth in West Virginia and some other surrounding states. But it is really interesting and people within the Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture here in West Virginia have a survey for this butterfly and caterpillar. This huge caterpillar here is the hickory horn devil and that is my hand. Uh, I took this picture about two weeks ago. And the hickory horn devil is a, it used to be a pretty common caterpillar, but now because of habitat change, like things like big box stores and suburbia spreading out into areas that used to be forest, this is becoming a more and more rare caterpillar. But again, West Virginia is mostly forested, so we actually have one of the highest populations of the hickory horn devil left on the eastern United States. So here's just a quick rundown of some of the common caterpillars that we have in West Virginia that you might see right now. The orange tipped oakworm, it is a orange caterpillar with some black stripes and some little black horns. And it is safe to touch, but you can find it, like its name says, oakworm, you can find it on oak trees. So again, go out, find an oak tree and you can look up and see if there was feeding in the canopy and maybe there will be some caterpillars there. The brown hooded owlet, this caterpillar is incredibly brightly colored and is growing on goldenrods or it's eating goldenrods and some of the other little pretty asters, the little like light purple flowers that are all over the fields right now with the goldenrod. You can probably find this guy if you just look close enough at the leaves that they're feeding on. We also have the famous woolly bear where this is also a caterpillar that is safe to touch, even though it does not look like it. Some people might be irritated by their hairs, but you can put that caterpillar on your hand and let it cruise around, it won't hurt you. But it turns into this beautiful Isabella moth. And the woolly bear is famous because it has the whole story of predicting the weather, but that is actually a myth. So if you want to tell anyone a cool fun fact about these guys, you can say that they change color as they get older. They will, when they're first little tiny caterpillars, they will be more black. And as they get older and continuously molt, they will become more orange. So they can survive in the grass, they eat things in our lawns, and then they go and pupate and turn into this Isabella moth. The monarchs, of course, are really popular right now. Uh, the, you'll likely see the adults flying and they are migrating. If any of you live down in Pocahontas County and you go to the uh, scenic highway, I saw a ton of the monarchs flying around this uh, last weekend. And if you look uh, at some of the milkweed plants, you still might see a few straggler caterpillars. Again, we go, if you want to find this caterpillar, knowing the host is important and going to a milkweed plant is really important. Our next caterpillar is the eastern tent. This is super common in the summertime. They grow in these like big masses on trees and you'll see their web over here, which looks like a tent. And they will all crawl out and eat whatever tree they're on. And then they are just a cute little brown moth in the fall. And we have an exotic caterpillar, which is very common here. It's actually called an invasive species. This is Lymontria despar. It has these three big blue dots followed by red dots, and it is very hairy. And this one is also safe to touch, 
but it should be managed. And actually the Department of Agriculture and Forest Service work really hard in trying to control this species because the caterpillar is so hungry that it will eat everything. So it's a pretty aggressive pest in West Virginia. So how can you learn more about caterpillars? There are some specific guides to our area and I use this book all the time. I love the caterpillars of Eastern North America. I actually carry around with me in my backpack all the time. It's a great book. And look, there's our owl hooded or our hooded owlet right there. Uh, there's also a guide that Kevin found at the library earlier this week, which is West Virginia butterflies and their caterpillars. And look at how many pages there are just for the butterflies of West Virginia. And then if you want to join some groups to learn about caterpillars and other insects, there is a virtual way to do this by joining the West Virginia Insect Identification Facebook page. It's got about 2000 people who just share pictures of insects that they find in our state and people help each other identify them. There's also the West Virginia Entomological Society, which has meet group uh, group meetings when, you know, we're allowed to do that. And we will go look for insects together and help each other identify them and learn. And sometimes we do really fun things at like certain times of the year, like we'll go caterpillar hunting, or we'll look for uh, the synchronous fireflies, which are in West Virginia. It's a really cool group where you can learn a lot. And if you're interested in learning more about like books and scientific publications, the Xerces Society and the Pollinator Partnership are really great national resource sources that make books. I'm actually reading one right now for my job and they have a lot of meetings and webinars. So you should check out their websites as well. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll let Kevin uh, ask some questions. So thank you for your attention.